Okay, let's start our lecture today. Last lecture, we've, <coughs> we've looked at uh, more examples about discrete time and the continuous time convolution. Uh, one exercise that uh, we did not cover is the application of distributive property of convolution. This is an example. So we have a input signal x of t, which is a linear signal, a t plus b. So a and b are constants. We have an LTI system whose in unit impulse response, h of t, looks like the figure. And uh, we need to calculate the output y of t for this LTI system. And as we know, y of t is the convolution of x and h. And because h has this uh, given structure, uh, it is natural to think that we can split h as h1 plus h2. So h1 is this platform which has height four or three. H2 is this impulse which has value minus one over three. So for the uh, shifty version of impulse, it can also take negative value. In that case, well, the arrow points uh, to, to the bottom points below to indicate negative. And uh, because of a distributive property, uh, x and uh, convolution h is x convolution h1 plus x convolution h2. So we look at these two terms separately. First, for h1, uh, we first need to look at uh, h t minus tau, because that is what we need in the integral that defines convolution. So h1 of tau, if we plot it in the tau axis, is still this uh, platform with height four over three, ranging from zero to one. And we first reflect this signal to obtain h1 minus tau, which is ranging from minus one to zero. And then from h1 minus tau to h1 t minus tau, we need to shift this signal so that the range of this platform changes from minus one zero to minus one plus t t. So this parameter t indicates how much we shift this signal. This is a practice that we did in last lecture. Now we calculate the convolution between x and h by looking at this integral. X of tau, uh, because its expression is already given, is a tau plus b. H1 of t minus tau is plotted in figure, in subfigure three here. And because of the uh, zero value taken by H1 of t minus tau outside the region minus one plus t t, we can shrink the integral region from infinite integral to a finite region integral. The lower upper limit are minus one plus one, the plus t to t respectively. And during that, re uh, inside that region, we can change h1 to four divided by three, which is the value that it takes. So this integral should not be hard to calculate. The first term inside the integral is linear, outside it's uh, quadratic. But don't forget to, to change the uh, coefficient to one half of the orange. So four or three will change it to two over three. And the second one, a constant inside the integral, it's just a linear term outside the integral. And we take, make a difference between the upper and lower bound. I will ignore the details, but the result is a linear function of t. So the coefficient is four or three a with a constant term expressed in a and b. So this is the convolution between x and h1. So what about h2? So h2 is a impulse that occurs at time tau equals two, and the impulse has negative value, minus one over three. And we, we do the same trick, first reflecting this impulse so that it occurs at minus two. And second, we shift it by t so that it occurs at minus two plus t. This is h2 t minus tau. And again, we calculate the convolution by looking at the integral. 
And this time in this integral, so h2 t minus tau, I write it explicitly. Minus one over three is its value. Delta is the notation for impulse, but this time the impulse occurs at minus two plus t. So that's why we write it as tau minus, minus two plus t. Right, this is an impulse on the, on the time axis tau. So tau is the time minus two plus t becomes a parameter indicating the location of that impulse. And for this kind of integral, we know, we learned the property that its value is just putting everything outside of integral, replace the tau in a tau plus b with the location where the impulse occurs. So replace tau with minus two plus t, everything follows, and the integral of this impulse is just one. The result is again a linear function of t with coefficient minus one over three a. And the final step is to just add up the two convolutions we calculated above. And after reorganizing those terms, we have the result, which is at plus b. And for this particular example, it is interesting to notice that the original signal is xt equals a t plus b. And the output of this system is also a t plus b. In other words, x t, the convolution of x and h is x itself. We learned that any signal is convolution with the unit impulse delta of t is the signal itself. But this example tells us that the reverse might not be true. So in this example, x convolution is convoluting with a signal h of t that looks like this. It's not a unit impulse, but still the result of a convolution is x of t itself. Just a remark here. Okay. Uh, so before we proceed to the properties of uh, LTI systems, uh, because I received an email from some students saying that this example we went through last lecture about uh, continuous time convolution uh, seems very confusing. So I decided to give you another exercise and we will go through this example together to consolidate our understanding about continuous time convolution. So, this time we have two signals. The unit impulse response of the LTI system H of T is expressed as difference between two uh, step signals. And the input signal this time looks a little bit more sophisticated. It's a cosine signal multiplies the difference of two step signals. Uh, to calculate the output YT, which is the convolution between these two signals. So to start with, I will give you two minutes to plot what signals X and H look like. And then from that, we will go through the convolution process together.
Okay. Let's look at the plots of these two signals, and uh, you can check if you are plotting them correctly. For x, of, well, first look at h of t on the right. So we plot u of t, the standard step, u of t minus 1, shifted by one unit to the right. The difference is this platform that ranges from 0 to 1. But don't forget the 1 half in front of it, so that the height of this platform, we need to mark it as 1 over 2. This is h of t. For x of t, we first look at the, the part inside the brackets, which is the difference between two steps. The first step, u of 1 over 2 minus t, we know that because it's minus t, the step jumps from 0 to 1, extends to the left. So there's that direction. And then because of this 1 over 2, it means that jumping point is 1 over 2. And similarly, for u of minus 1 over 2 minus t, the direction that this step extends is still to the left. But now this jump point is minus 1 over 2. And that difference is just this platform that ranges between negative and positive 1 over 2. And then we multiply this part with cosine 2 pi t. So cosine 2 pi t is a signal which takes uh, the highest value one at zero, and then ex extends uh, infinitely from to both left and right. But because of this, because of the limitation of this uh, platform, we only retain, we only keep the part inside the inside the period around point zero, so from minus one over two to one over two, and because the height of this platform is one. We keep the value of cosine two pi t. So here I forgot to mark, but the peak and the value of this signal x of t are respectively one negative, uh, negative one. So this is what x of t looks like. Then we look at the uh, convolution. Again, we are looking at the integral of x of tau h of t minus tau. Uh, the first operation is to always obtain h of t minus tau from h of tau. h of tau is this, again, from last page, is this uh, platform ranges from 0 to 1. So reflection, h of minus tau, and then we shift it by t. So after reflection, the flat platform ranges from minus 1 to 0. And after the shift by t, we have a starting end point, both change by, by t, so minus 1 plus t and t. And why it is important to notice the starting and end point of this platform? That's because when we calculate the product of these two terms, h and h, for every time tau, it really depends on the, uh, the shape of h of t minus tau in the range where x of tau is non-zero. So that needs the discussion over t. Again, we are looking at these two signals, both at the, uh, both under the tau axis. So if you notice the time axis, they are all the axis of tau, and they are aligned, al aligned vertically. So which means from the above to below, uh, minus one, over two minus one over two, all these points are aligned. So we are looking at their product at the same tau always. And then t becomes a parameter that determines the starting and end points of this platform of H. For the case that where I labeled one and four, for case one, t is less than one half. For case four, four t is larger than three divided by two. For these two cases, the platform is either completely on the left or completely on the right of the region where x tau is sinusoidal. In that case, if you look at the pointwise product between x of tau and h of t minus tau, for every tau, the result is zero because either x or h at least one of them takes value zero. Therefore, their multi, their product is zero. But for cases two and three, we need more careful discussion. If you look at case two, where this location indicating parameter t is between minus one half to one half, 
So if you look at the starting point of minus one plus t, it should be less than minus one half. So, so make sure that you that we uh, mark the rel rel relative location of minus one plus t and minus one half correctly. So minus one plus t is on the left, and then minus one half, and then t, which is between minus and plus one half. But because of this location, if you look at the product of x and h, it is zero before minus one half because the signal above is zero. It, is non, it becomes non-zero from minus one half to t and the product is the signal above, which is cosine two pi t, multiplies the signal below, which takes the value one over two. The height of this platform is one over two. And then starting from t, the signal below is zero. So the product of these two again becomes zero. So write it out, the product is minus, uh, is one half cosine two pi tau for tau ranging between minus one half and t. And outside of the region, it takes value zero. Similarly, for the case three, the region where the product is one half cosine two pi tau occurs from minus one plus t to one half. Because in this region, the signal below is one half, signal above takes the sinusoidal shape. But outside of this region, say to the left of minus one plus t, the signal below is zero. To the right of one half, the signal above is zero. So the product is zero. That's the, the result that I wrote in a case three. So in this example, we need to discuss the product of x at h for four different cases of t. And for each case, we can further calculate the integral. For the first and last case, we are taking the integral of a signal that's constantly zero. So the integral is also zero. For the second, third case, we are taking the integral one half cosine two pi tau. So we're taking the integral one half cosine two pi tau, but the integral range or integral limits are different. For the second case, it's minus one half to t. For the third case, it's minus one plus t to one half. So we copy down these ranges as the integral limits for the respective case. And when calculated this integral, so the derivative of sine signal is cosine, but don't forget that when we uh, take derivative of sine two pi t, there is an additional coefficient two pi that needs to be, uh, that need to be multiplied with cosine. That's why when we take uh, calculate the integral, we change one half to one over four pi. And so we take the difference between upper lower bound, sine two pi tau becomes sine two pi t because the upper bound is t. Sine minus pi is zero. So the result is this for case two, similar result is this for case three. If you are interested, you can plot this signal. So for t, so, so as the result of yt, we again look at the signal in the t-axis. Uh, I mentioned this uh, transform of, uh, or this switch of time variable. When we calculate the integral, we look at integral time tau, and t is a parameter, is a location, uh, is a location deter deciding parameter. And when we look at the final result, it again becomes a signal over t. For t less than one over two, larger than three divided by two, it, it corresponds to cases one to four, the result is zero. For case two is sine two pi t multiplies one over four pi. And for case three, it, the t is changed to one minus t. So it just, which is a symmetric with case two over uh, the symmetric axis one over two. It's a continuous signal that looks like this. Now let's come to the new uh, content, which is other properties of RTI systems. We've learned six properties in chapter one and 
for LTI system, it already possesses two of those six properties, linearity and time inverse. So what about the other four properties? Uh, to recap, they are memory list, causality, invertibility, and stability. To tell whether an LTI system uh, satisfies those, uh, owns these properties or not, we can still use the same methods that we learned in chapter one. But for LTI system, we have an alternative method to tell whether these properties hold. And perhaps these methods are easier than the method we learned in chapter one. So now let's take a look. We first look at the memory list property. And recall the definition from chapter one. We take a discrete time system as example. Discrete time system is memory list if at every time n, the output yn depends only on input x of n. So in other words, does not depend on x at other time, n minus plus one, n minus plus two, etc. For the LTI system, if we want to validate, uh, we want to justify memory list or not of this system from the input output behavior, we can still use the method in chapter one, but most of the time, LTI system will only give the unit impulse response denoted H of N, because as I said earlier, H of N is an inherent property of the system itself. So how to tell whether the system is memoryless or not from H of N? Let's look at the output YN, which is convolution between X and H because of the of the commutative property, we can write H first and X second. And the definition of a discrete time convolution is this infinite sum over K. And we spread it for a few terms around zero. So from for K equals minus two minus one, zero, one, two, notice that this is minus K. So we always flip the sign. For h minus two, the terms that follows it is x of n plus two. And similarly, we have plus one n. For h one, the term that follows is x of n minus one, and n minus two, etc. So this is a infinite. We only write five of these terms. Now look at the definition. For the system to be memoryless, yn can only depend on x of n. So now I have a quick question for you. When is this system expressed in this, in this equation? When is it memoryless? So think about it for 10 seconds and then I will reveal the answer. Some of you already guessed that uh, we need these terms. So h of minus two, minus one, one, two, actually all the h except h of zero to be zero, because only in that case, we can eliminate the impact of all those terms, x of n minus plus one, n minus plus two. We can eliminate those, the impact of those terms to the output. And in other words, when this h at these times all take zero value, y of n becomes simply h n uh, h zero times x of n, and it fits the definition that x of n only depends on x of n, and the system becomes memories. So formally, in this blue box, for discrete time LTI system whose unit impulse response is h of n. It is memoryless if and only if h of n is zero for all non-zero n. So in other words, h of n can only be non-zero at n equals zero. And we have a corollary from this uh, property. So if a LTI system is memoryless, then its unit impulse response must be written in the following form. So h of n is some constant k times delta of n. So what is delta of n? We learned it. it is the 
unit step. It is zero everywhere. It is one at n equals zero. So because h of n is also zero everywhere except h of zero. So as shown by these three figures, h of n is zero everywhere. It can take positive or negative or zero value at h of zero. And this value does not have to be one. That's why we multiply start of n with a constant k. So the constant can be positive, negative, or zero. And indeed, this constant k is h of zero. So if we have this property about h, we can further imply the input and output relationship for LTI, for memory-based LTI system. The input output must satisfy y of n equals k times x of n. Why? Because y of n for LTI system is the convolution of x and h. Now, h must be k times delta. We can extract constant k and leave x convolution delta inside the brackets. And we learn that the convolution of any signal with the unit impulse is the signal itself. So h convolution delta is x, uh, sorry, x convolution delta is x itself. Therefore, yn equals k of x. It means that for a LTI system, which is memoryless, y of n must be a linear function of x of n for some constant coefficient k. This is different from a general LTI system because for general LTI system, y of n can be any function of x of n. We did the example before in chapter one. y of n can be x n square, can be sine of x n, and so on. Those systems are always memoryless. But for LTI system, the only form that this system can be memoryless is y of n equals k multiplies x of n. And this structure can be extended to continuous time as well. It does not look differently, except for the uh, time index, uh, t versus n. Now, to uh, help our understanding, let's look at four examples. We have these four systems. Are they, all of them are, uh, actually all of them are LTI because the unit impulse response H of T are given to us. And the questions are whether they're memoryless or not. Uh, let's first do the two examples on the left, which are both for discrete time system. Uh, one minute. Okay, let's so first look at the results associated with these two discrete time systems. So the first example is a little bit tricky. Uh, it seems that, so we just learned that we must have h of n equals k times delta of n, but this time we have delta of n squared. So the first response is that that's not a memory system, but it turns out that it's memory because if you look at this signal, to delta n square more carefully. It is, so delta of n equals one when n equals zero. So h of n equals two square, which is four at n equals zero. And for n, which is non-zero, delta of n is zero, so we are looking at zero square, which is also zero. So it turns out that h of n can be simplified to four times delta of n. It is zero everywhere except for n equals zero, where it is four. 
so it uh, meets the definition for memory system. So that's memories. And for the second signal, so when now we plot it out, one over two to the power n, this is a signal that has uh, valid values for both n positive and negative. For n positive, say we have one over two to the power one, which is one over two or equals one, and then one over two to the power two, which is one over four, it becomes smaller and smaller as n becomes more positive. For n negative, when n equals minus two, so we have one over two to the power minus two, which equals two to the power two, which is four. So it becomes larger and larger when n goes, it becomes more negative. That's the first part. Second part, u of one minus n. So it involves two operations of the standard unit step signal u of n. First, we do the time reflection so that the step, it jumps from zero to one when we look to the left. And second, we shift it to the right by one unit so that the jumping point becomes one instead of zero. We multiply these two signals. The row of u one minus n is to restrict the signal above on, only to n equals one and uh, whatever is on the left. So for n equals one and every point to the left, we keep the same value as one over two to the power n. But for n equals two and everything to the right, the u of one minus n just eliminates everything to zero. But anyway, because h of n can take non-zero values at n equals minus one, minus two, and so on, it fails the test of this uh, memoryless uh, property. Therefore, this system is not memoryless. Now let's have one minute for the two examples on the right for continuous time system. Half a minute, because it, this should be simpler after the, you look at the discrete time example. Okay, so let's look at, so h of t, which is two exponential minus t u t. So exponential minus t, we know that a signal that ranges over all the real number t, but is decaying as t increases. Multiplies u of t so that it becomes zero when t is less than zero. We only keep the part of this exponential when t is larger than zero. We plot it, it looks like this, but this is not a impulse signal. For the system to be memoryless, h of t must be some constant that multiplies impulse. This is definitely not. So that's not a memoryless system. Uh, for the second signal, cosine high over two t times delta of t. Because delta of t is the impulse that occurs at time t equals zero. And everywhere else, delta of t just becomes zero. So the value of cosine pi over 2t beyond zero does not matter. And this signal is equivalent to cosine pi over 2 zero times delta of t. And cosine pi over 2 zero is one. So the signal becomes one times delta of t, which is a impulse signal itself. Therefore, it means it, it satisfies the a proper memoryless property. Now let's look at the second property, which is uh, causality. Again, we use discrete time system as example. In chapter one, we learned that the definition of a causal system is that at every time, output yn only depends on x at time n and before n, in other words, n, n minus one, n minus two. 
So it does not depend on x of n plus one, n plus two, does not depend on the future time. That's how a memory list, uh, how a causal system is defined. And then we look at the causal property for LTI system. Again, we can turn to its unit impulse response, H over N, to tell if it is causal or not. Look at Y of N, which is the convolution of H and X, the infinite sum over integer index K. Again, we spread this, spread this uh, infinite sum by uh, enumerating several terms from k equals minus two to two. This is the same as we've seen in the previous few slides. For the system to be causal, y of n can only depend on x of n, x of n minus one, x of n minus two. So in other words, it is causal if and only if the coefficients bef bef uh, before x of n plus one, x of n plus two, and so on, are all zero. In other words, h of minus two, h of minus one, and even before that, h of minus three, minus four, and so on, are all zero. Only with this condition, we can eliminate the impact of future signals on the output y of n. So to formalize the statement, a discrete time LTI system is causal if and only if its unit impulse response H of n is zero for all negative n. And the same property can be extended to continuous time. Uh, continuous time is causal if and only if H of t is zero for all negative t. So let's practice with these four examples. Again, first look at the two examples on the left for uh, discrete time. One minute. Okay, for the two discrete time examples, it turns out that, that neither of them is causal. For the first one, we can plot, uh, actually we already plotted in the previous example. Uh, so the point is, H of N is non-zero for all the N that is uh, minus, one minus two and so on. So if we check this property, it requires that H of N is zero for all negative N. But definitely for those negative Ns, H of N is not zero. So that's why it does not meet the requirement for causal system. And for this kind of system to tell that it is not causal, instead of uh, plotting the full signal, sometimes only a counter example is enough. For example, if you look at this second example, uh, second uh, system, the H of N, we only look at its particular value at N equals minus one. In that case, we are looking at minus three to the power of minus one, which is minus one, one over three, and the U minus one plus two, which is U of one. U 
of n is the standard unit step signal. It is defined in a way that for all the positive n, u of n is, for all the non-active n, u of n is zero. Therefore, u1 is, sorry, for all the non-active n, u of n is one. Therefore, if you look at the particular value u of one, is the value of this step at time one, which is one. Therefore, h of minus one is minus one over three, which is non-zero. It fails the test of this property for causal system, right? Because for less than zero, it needs to be zero. But this time we find a h of n for n negative that's not zero. So this is a this is not a causal system. Now one minute for the two examples on the right for continuous time system. Okay, for these two continuous time systems, the first one is causal. So this time we do not plot the signal out, but let's just look at the structure of this signal. It contains a U of T minus two. We know that U of T is a standard unit step that jumps from zero to one at point T equals zero. Then U of T minus two jumps from zero to one at time t equal to. In other words, u of t minus two is zero for all t less than two. As a result, whatever is multiplied with u of t minus two, h of t is also zero for all t minus two. And it's zero in the bigger range of t minus two, therefore it must be zero in the sub range t minus zero. And this is exactly what is required by the LTI system to be causal. So this, term, this system is causal. For the second continuous time system, we, again, we just find a counter example, say t equals minus 100. This is a negative t. For this negative t, u of t is zero because that's the definition of the unit step signal. So the first term becomes zero. Whatever u, whatever u of t multiplies with, it makes everything to zero. But the second term, we replace t with minus 100, we have exponential minus one. Therefore, the signal h is non-zero at a negative time t equals minus 100. It fails the test of the causality property, therefore it's not a causal system. Okay. Now let's have a 15 minutes break. We come back at 12.30 to continue the study of the rest of properties, invertibility and stability. Stability, uh, I did not cast a formal definition. Instead, I will just show it in an intuitive way. Let's look at this figure. We have a system, an LTI system, whose unit impulse response is H of T, as illustrated by this block on the left. An input signal X of T enters this system, produces 
response, in other words, output signal y of t. If there is another system whose which is also LTI and whose unit impulse response is H1 of T, so that when we enter Y of T as input, the output signal becomes X of T again. So the ultimate output is the same as the very original input. If we can find such a system with H1 of T, then we say that H of T is invertible and its inverse system has the unit impulse response H1 of T. So the system above is the cascade or the series connection of two systems, one with unit impulse response H of T, one with H1 of T. And this system is equivalent to a single LTI system whose unit impulse response is the convolution of H and H1. So that property we learned before about the, when we, when we learned the uh, distributive property of the convolution. And if you look at this equivalent system, what, it tell, what this figure tells us is that the input is X, output is also X. So it means this system is a so-called identity system. The unit impulse of this equivalent system is delta of t. Why is it delta of t? Because x of t going through this system, the output should be x of t convolution delta of t. And we know that x convolution with delta is the, is the, uh, is the signal itself. Uh, actually, this uh, relates to this example that we look at at the beginning of this class. So when we look at this example, we see that when x of t convolution with some signal is x of t itself, that signal might not be unit impulse. That signal can be something looks like this h of t. But that's a very particular case. But they, I, th I guess uh, I would rather say this is a uh, this is a very ad hoc case that we can construct. For LTI system, we come back to the invertibility page. What is needs is that for any input, for every input x of t, the output is x of t itself. Then the only unit impulse response that can satisfy this requirement is delta of t. For the example we look at at the beginning of this lecture, we really need a particular input x of t equals at plus b to produce the result that input output are the same. But this time we, for an LTI system, we need it to convert every x of t to the active itself. That the only uh, system set by this is the identity system with the unit impulse response delta. Okay. Yeah, uh, I got a question from the chat window in the private mode. It said that that's the hardest to prove. If we don't find H1 of T, it does not mean it's not invertible. That's right. If we can find H1 of T, it tells us that the system is invertible. But if we cannot find H1 of T, we cannot say it's not invertible. Because it's, it's just because we did not find it doesn't mean it does not exist. So that, that's why for the invertibility property, uh, we do not have uh, exercise and homework problems. It's just a concept for you to know uh, the practical problems associated with invertible LTI systems uh, are beyond the scope of this uh, class. But anyway, let's formalize this result. Uh, H, uh, so a continuous time LTI system H of T is invertible and its inverse system 
has unit impulse response H1 of T if the convolution of H and H1 is delta of T. That's exactly what we derived from the last page. And this property holds for the uh, discrete time, except that we change time index from T to N. Okay, uh, we have some in homework. I'm not sure for LTI system, we still have homework related to invertibility. Uh, if there is, then that must be the simplest case that you can easily find the inverse, uh, you easily find the unit impulse response for the inverse system. Otherwise, it, uh, it, will, not be, it will not be in the homework. Uh, now let's jump to the next property, which is stability. As you recall the definition from uh, chapter one, a discrete time system is stable if for any bounded input, the output is also bounded. And that's associated with the definition of what is a bounded signal. Uh, for discrete time signal X of N, we say that it is bounded if we can find a constant such that the modulus or the magnitude or the absolute value of x of n is less than or equal to b for all the integer n. So we can, the point is we can find the one integer that bounds x for all the time, then it is bounded. So how do we apply this boundedness or this definition of stability to LTI system? So for LTI system, when we want to check whether the output is bounded, we again turn to the convolution. Y of n is the convolution of x and h, uh, which is this infinite sum. And we can use the, uh, this inequality to make the uh, absolute value inside the infinite sum. So by this operation, we are always, we always make this, this result non-decreasing. So now we are at this step. The next step is to utilize the bound on X of K absolute value. Because we, what we want to check ultimately is whether Y is bounded for a bounded X. So we first assume X is bounded. So we can replace X with B we uh, replace the absolute value of x with b. And since b is a constant, we can extract it outside the summation symbol. And don't forget that's less than or equal to, as this is less than equal to. Now for this thing inside the uh, summation symbol, we make a substitution of the index. Let m equals n minus k. So, for the entire series of equations and inequalities, we are looking at a particular n, a particular time n. And inside the summation, what changes is the index k. So if we substitute m, uh, n minus k with m, then what changes is m. But when k is negative infinity, m is positive infinity because of this minus sign and vice versa. That's why when we change n minus k with m, we change the lower and we flip the lower and upper limit of this summation. But for discrete time summation, it does not matter which one is the lower and which one is the upper limit. So we can flip it back without changing the result. So this is the result. For y to be bounded, the summation of hm of a slow value must be bounded. In other words, the summation of this, this infinite sum must be finite because only when it is finite, we can find a constant number to bound it. So this is a, I remark that this is a sufficient condition for stability because so far what we prove is that if this infinite sum is bounded, then y of n, which is smaller than or equal to this infinite sum, must also be bounded. But actually, this is also a necessary condition. Necessary condition means if it is not bounded, 
then y of n is not bounded for some particular input. The proof for this necessary condition is skipped, but we can draw the conclusion that a discrete time LTI system is stable if and only if, so we look at the infinite sum of the absolute value of its unity impulse response, then this infinite sum is a finite number. If it's a finite number, then the system is stable. And uh, we extend this result to continuous time system. For continuous time, the infinite sum becomes an infinite integral. So the continuous time LTI system has a unit impulse response H of T. We take the absolute value of H of T, make the integral of this absolute value. If this infinite integral is a finite number, then the system is stable. Otherwise, it is not stable. So to further understand these uh, results, let's look at, for example, two for discrete time, two for continuous time. Let's first look at the two on the left for discrete time. I will give you oh, one minute. Uh, to respond to a question. So H of T is decreasing with T? No. For, um, well, it might not, let, let me see. If you are seeing that as T goes to infinity, is H of T decreasing or not? I mean, in general, we need that H of T becomes smaller and smaller, and its absolute value approaching zero as T goes to infinity. Because if H of T absolute value itself is not zero, then its absolute value, its integral will just keep blowing up as T goes to infinity. So, I mean, generally, the answer is yes. Although it's not a rigorous answer, it needs some, uh, some formal uh, definition of what is, the, uh, what is the decreasing and what is the integral. Okay. Let's look at the results associated with discrete time systems. The first one, if you just check it by the properties we learned, H of n absolute value is one over n to the power n because it's a non-negative number anyway. But for the infinite sum of H of n, we can change it to a, we can change the upper bound. Uh, we can change the upper limit of the summation to one because of this u one minus n. We've seen from previous example that u of one minus n becomes zero for all the n that is larger than one. That's why it eliminates all the terms for n larger than one. And for this summation, which extends to the to, uh, to n equals negative infinity, if you look at the first term, n equals one, it's one half. Second term, n equals zero, which is one third term n equals minus one, which is two, and then one half to the power minus two is four. As n goes to negative infinity, one over two to the power n becomes larger and larger. And the summation will also blow up to positive infinity. Since it's not finite, then the system is not stable. And look at the second one, which has two parts. So we also want to check by the uh, definition. Look at the infinite sum of HK absolute value. We write it in three parts. H of zero need a special treatment. So we cast it as a separate term. And then the second part is for all the positive K. The third part is for all the negative K. For H of zero, if you just replace n with zero, then we have 
two to the uh, one over two to the power zero, which is one, u of zero is one by the definition of standard unit step C. So the first term is one. The second term is minus three to the power zero, which is one, u of minus zero, which is again u zero, which is one. So the second term is also one. So h of zero and its absolute value is two. If you look at all the positive index k, the second term becomes zero because for n being positive, minus n is negative, and u of a negative number by the standard definition of unit step is zero. So the second term becomes zero. We only look at the first term, which is one over two to the power n times one. And in particular, it's one over two, one over four, one over three, uh, so sorry, one, one over eight, because it is one over two to the power n for n positive. The third part is for n negative. And again, utilizing the definition of u of n, for n being negative, u of n becomes zero. So the first terms all become zero. The second term, u of minus n becomes one. So we are only looking at minus three to the power n. Here, because we are looking at the absolute value, so we can discard the minus sign in front of three. Three to the power n for n being negative. For example, when a equals negative minus one, we are looking at three to the power minus one, which is one over three. Three to the power minus two, which is one over nine. Again, we are looking at a decaying series. And for both the, the second and the third part, we can write the result of this infinite sum as a finite number by you just using the formula. So on the numerator is the first term, on the denominator is one over one minus common ratio. And this is a finite number. Therefore, it meets the requirement for stable system. Now, let's have one more minute for the uh, two examples on the right for continuous time. Okay, so this system turns out to be instable. Uh, we again look at this integral of h of t absolute value, and for convenience, we plot it over t. We only plot it for t larger than two because of this restriction u of t minus two, which makes everything for t less than two zero. Uh, therefore, we can change the lower limit of the integral from minus infinity to two. But even after that, if you look at the integral, because it has the absolute value, so we flip the everything below the horizontal axis 
to above the horizontal axis. And when taking integral, we are looking at the area covered by this curve. As t goes to infinity, positive infinity, this area just blows up to infinity. And therefore, this integral is not finite and the system is instable. And for the second example of a continuous time system. So we have two parts. The first part is two exponential minus t ut. Because of this ut, everything before zero is set to zero. After zero, it just looks like exponential minus t, which is a decaying signal. And for the second part, exponential 0.01t, it also starts at t equals zero, but this time as t increases, the signal blows up. And because one is decaying over t until it approaches zero, the other is blowing up to infinity, and both signals are monotonically decreasing or increasing. Then our argument is that there must be a point t0, such that at this point, the values of the signals above and below are the same. And for t right to t0, in other words, t larger than t0, the signal below will exceed the signal above. So why we make this argument? Because it is useful for, for our proof of an instability system. For instability, again, look at the property that we learned, taking the finite integral, uh, the, taking, taking the infinite integral of slope value, h of t is replaced by this. Because of u of t, we can change the lower limit of integral to zero. And this, we can further change the lower limit from zero to t zero. And by changing that, because t0 is positive, we are discarding part of the integral from 0 to t0. And every period of this integral is an integral over positive, uh, over non-negative numbers. That's why when we shrink the integral region, which we have this larger than equal to sign, which means the value on the right-hand side becomes smaller. And because now because of this argument, we know that for the region t larger than t0, the second term is larger than the first term. So we can remove the, uh, remove the absolute value by putting the second term first because this value is, this difference is non-negative. And we can now split it has two integral. The first integral is for exponential minus, uh, exponential positive, uh, exponential point zero one t. And look at this integral. The signal itself blows up to infinity. And if we take its integral from t zero to infinity, the area covered by this curve also goes to infinity. For the second term, we are looking at an integral of two exponential minus t. So from t0, this signal on, on the, is, this signal is decaying over time. It approaches zero. And actually for exponential minus t, we can calculate its integral. Uh, in particular, when t goes to positive infinity, exponential minus t, does become zero. That's the uh, lower limit of this integral. So the second term of this integral is finite. We have a infinite number minus a finite number. The result is also a positive infinity. In other words, the integral of h absolute value goes to positive infinity, which are so to show that it's a finite value, I, I, I put it here in the green, uh, green color. So it's minus two exponential minus t, take difference between positive infinity and t zero, which just two exponential minus t zero. It's a finite number. 
the result is that the system is instable because this integral goes to positive infinity. So now we are at the point to summarize the entire chapter two LTI systems. We first provided an overview of LTI systems to obtain the response of LTI system to input signal. We learned, we defined the unit impulse response, which is an inherent property of an LTI system. And then we learned the mathematical tool convolution. Output is the input convolution with the unit impulse response. This convolution operator, similar to the regular multiplication, possesses the commutative, uh, distributive, and associative uh, property. And then at the last part of this chapter, we have uh, other four properties of LTI systems. And we can use method in chapter one to tell if LTI system satisfies each of these four properties or not. But if the unit impulse responses of LTI systems are given to us, then we can tell these properties hold on, whether these properties hold or not, just by checking the property, the structures of unit impulse response H, which turns out to be more convenient. So now let's jump out of LTI system and come to the next chapter. Yes, that's, that's a hard chapter. So a lot of uh, uh, concepts to understand for this chapter. And it's not simply the computation techniques or skills. It's understanding some of those tools really needs uh, some intuition. So chapter three is the Fourier series for periodic signals. So first let's recap the most important knowledge that we learned from last chapter, LTI system. So we are given an LTI system. And remember that what motivates our study of unit impulse response and the convolution is that any input signal, let's take discrete time signal, for example, can be represented as linear combination of time shifted versions of unit impulses. And this is defined as the convolution of X with the unit impulse. And because of the linear, linearity and time invariance property of the system, the output Yn has the same structure as the input. It's also a linear combination. And the linear combination even has the same coefficient. So we treat X as the coefficient for every term of this linear combination. The only thing that changes from input to output is that we change delta to H. So in other words, we change unit impulse to unit impulse response. And the output is X convolution H. So that's what we learned from last chapter. And this can be useful for both discrete time system and continuous time system. So discrete time convolution is infinite sum, continuous time convolution is integral. And for this chapter, we still focus on the behavior of LTI systems, but we are looking at not an arbitrary input, but input signals, which are periodic. It turns out that when the input signals are periodic signals, the output of an LTI system can be obtained in a way that is more convenient than calculating the convolution. Now you did the homework, you know that how complicated it can be to calculate convolution of two signals. But for input signals that are periodic, 
we can obtain their outputs more conveniently than convolution. And to realize this purpose, we will learn alternative representation of periodic signal. In previous chapter, by convolution, we are basically represent a signal as a linear combination of time shifted unit impulses. But in this chapter, we will express signals as, we will express periodic signals as linear combination of complex exponentials. If you still remember what we learned in chapter one, complex exponential signals are extensions of sinusoidal signals. So basically a signal with both real part and imaginary part sinusoidal signals with the help of Euler's formula can be expressed as complex exponentials. And this kind of representation, the linear combination of complex exponentials is known as Fourier series. So we will learn Fourier series, its definition, its properties, and application in LTI systems for both continuous time and discrete time. Uh, it turns out that uh, we will devote about 70 to 80 percent time on continuous time and the rest of the time on discrete time. Uh, overall speaking, the continuous and discrete time signal systems are of the equal importance in engineering practice. Or sometimes discrete time system may be more common and important if you look at the prevalent digital communication and multimedia systems. But for this uh, 13 week class, we instead focus more on continuous time signals and systems. That's it because discrete time signals and systems have more subtleties and uh, caveats that needs to be that need to be paid attention to. And those subtle details sometimes may hide the intrinsic structure and will not help our understanding of the mathematical tools that are learned. For example, in chapter one, we've seen when both a continuous time and discrete time system are written in the same form, except for the difference of time index T versus N, a continuous time signal is periodic, but the discrete time signal might not be periodic, right? There is a condition for when a discrete time sinusoidal signal to be periodic. And we also seen the example that when we compress a continuous time signal over time, all the data points are retained. But when we compress a discrete time signal, some of those data points are lost. And later we will see in this chapter that continuous and discrete time Fourier series have different structures. So basically continuous time Fourier series is an infinite sum, but discrete time Fourier series is a finite sum because of the repetitive patterns of discrete time exponential, uh, discrete time complex exponential signals. So that's just a heads up why we devote more time on continuous time. So since we want to express signals as linear combinations of complex exponentials, let's quickly recall what are the exponential signals. Exponential signal for the exponent being real number is straightforward to understand. Just two cases, exponential RT is blowing up over T when R is positive, decaying with T when R is negative. Now, if we replace R with S, where S is a pure imaginary number, J omega zero, then using the Euler's formula, exponential J omega zero T is cosine omega zero T plus J sine omega zero T. So the cosine sine signal does not look much different except for a pi over two difference. So we only look at the cosine signal, which is periodic, Fundamental period is two pi divided by omega zero. Omega zero is called the fundamental frequency or cosine signal. And therefore this 
imaginary exponential signal, exponential j omega zero t is also periodic with fundamental frequency omega zero. A little bit more complicated case, we have S as a full complex number with both non-zero real and reactive parts, the real and the imaginary parts. So we split them, exponential RT becomes the magnitude of this signal, which changes over T. And exponential J omega zero T is still the cosine the sine, and we only plot cosine because the similarity of sine. The oscillation is still at a frequency omega zero, in other words, at a period two pi divided by omega zero. But at this time, the magnitude of the signal is changing over T because of this exponential RT. When R is positive, the magnitude is blowing up. When R is negative, the magnitude is decaying. So this magnitude just intuitively understand as an envelope that limits the oscillation. That's a quick review of exponential signals. Now, what if this kind of exponential signal is the input to an LTI system? So that's what motivates our definition of Fourier series. So let's tune up for this moment. We have an LTI system, input signal x of t is exponential s of t. s can be any complex number. What is y of t? Remember that for LTI system, what we can begin with is always to calculate output using convolution, right? It can be convolution of x and h can be convolution of h and x because of commutative property. Okay, it's a integral of h tau x of t minus tau d tau. x of t minus tau, we replace the input signal replace the t with t minus tau, it becomes exponential as t minus tau. Notice that inside the integral, the integral variable is tau, and the t becomes a parameter that's irrelevant to the integral. That's why we can extract e exponential st outside of the integral. What's inside the integral is only the exponential minus s tau. For convenience, we define this integral, h tau exponential minus s tau d tau with the symbol h of s. It is a function of s only because after taking the integral, tau does not matter anymore. So only the value of s affects this integral. That's why it's written as a function of s. So we have y of t equals h of s exponential s t. H of s, again, its definition is inherent from this equation. It's the exponential h tau, exponential minus tau, e tau, d tau. Therefore, for LTI system, if we input exponential signal, the output is this exponential signal multiplies some function h of s. And by the way, this input signal, exponential s of t, is, some, is often called the eigenfunction of the LTI system. And correspondingly, h of s, which is defined here, is called the eigenvalue associated with, it, with this eigenfunction exponential s of t. Why is this result useful? So let's now keep this result in mind, look at more complicated cases. We have the same LTI system. So in the three figures, we are looking at the same system, but we are just changing the input. S can be arbitrary complex number. So we use S1, S2, S3 to denote three particular and different complex numbers as input to the system. And its output is H of S1, H of S2, H of S3 multiplies the corresponding input. Again, H of S1 is defined here just replacing s with s1 on both sides of the equation. So because of linearity of the system, if we 
have a new input to the same system, which is the linear combination of these three inputs. So linear combination coefficients are A1, A2, A3. They can be any constant co complex numbers. Then due to linearity, the output is the same linear combination of H times S, right? A1, HS1, exponential S1, T, and so on. And this finite sum can also be extended to infinite sum, which means if we write it in a, exponential, uh, in a compact form, this infinite sum is AK exponential SK of T for integer index K from minus infinity to positive infinity. And still the linearity holds. The output is also an infinite sum, an infinite linear combination. For each term, the coefficient is still a k, but we change from exponential skt to h over sk times exponential skt. So to summarize this phenomenon verbal, if x of t can be expressed as a linear combination of eigenfunctions, exponential skt, then yt, the output of the RTI system, is the same coefficient linear combination of h of sk eigenvalues multiplies exponential skt, the eigenfunctions. And the good news is that in practice, any periodic input signal x of t can be written in this form. And in particular, so this property holds for arbitrary complex number s of k. But when the signal x of t is periodic, we can even have more specific s of k, which has zero real part and is a imaginary number. In other words, we have input, which is a linear combination of purely imaginary exponentials. Then the output is the same coefficient linear combination with additional capital H. And then we replace everywhere S with J omega K. The definition of H still applies, just a change S to J omega K. And the way that we express X of T as the linear combination of exponential J omega K T is called the Fourier series representation of X of T, for which we will study more detail in the next lecture. Okay, uh, see you on Friday, thanks.